Uh, my name is Tim Clevenger. This is Access Control done right the first time. Just a little bit about me by day. I'm a network cybersecurity engineer uh, for SailPoint in Austin. Um, but in a previous life, I was Linnell S2 certified in both access control and video. And I did a half sysadmin, half field tech job where I got to get in the truck and out of the dark server room and go visit sites and do repairs and upgrades and modifications on access control and video systems throughout Southern California. Uh, so getting to see a lot of newer systems installed by other companies as well as the company I worked for and kind of a lot of older systems, I learned some tips and tricks that I think that'll help if you're planning an access control system, you're moving into a new building, maybe you need to upgrade or replace the system that you have in place now, or if you just wanna have a, a more secure and reliable system. I am uh, on, on the Physical Security Village Discord as well as DC512 and a couple of other ones. My handle's NSFW. I didn't choose it, it was assigned to me. I'm not gonna say why. A little bit about this talk, so like I said, I'm gonna present some tips and tricks here. At the end of this presentation, I'll have a QR code that'll take you to a GitHub repo that I've created where later this evening I'll have an RFP that will have essentially everything that I've talked about here that you could give to your legal team and your uh, procurement team to give to an access control vendor and just make sure that they're not gonna cut any corners on you during your installation. Uh, many vendors will sell what I call a minimal viable product. It functions, it, it beeps when you badge in and it unlocks the door, but it may not be the best system for your risk profile or for maintainability in the future. So I'll start with choosing a system. The systems that I worked on were largely uh, powered by boards from a company called Mercury Security. They're one of the largest vendors. I have no connection with them other than I've used their equipment and I like it. Uh, they have local storage on them, so if you're Facebook and you accidentally blow up your DNS, you don't have to pry open your server room doors to fix your servers. Uh, they have multiple vendor support and they can be reflashed with different firmware, so if you decide that you know, Vigilon or Linnell is not for you and you want to switch to a different vendor, often you can keep all of the same equipment, reflash all the boards, and go to with another vendor. So it's a little more uh, useful in that pers uh, perspective as well. Uh, so we'll have some layout considerations. I'll give you a couple of examples here. Uh, the way that these systems typically work is there's a more expensive, more powerful board that I call an access panel. That's gonna store a copy of all of your card holders and card numbers. It's gonna store logs and return them back to the server that runs your software. Uh, those are typically connected with ethernet. So you'll have an ethernet drop somewhere with one of these boards and then you'll daisy chain additional boards to that with a wonderful protocol called RS-485. Anybody here in access control at all? No, you haven't, you haven't enjoyed the wonder that is two pairs of wire with a foil shield. Uh, this wire is basically allows you to daisy chain up to 31 devices off of your access panel for a total of 64 doors being controlled and it can go up to 4,000 feet. Please do not do this. It will not work for you, you will be so unhappy uh, what happens with RS-485 is you have a, a communications problem somewhere in that 4,000 feet and you're now having to start disconnecting devices to figure out where in the chain the mice chew through the wires or the foil broke or somebody installed an electrical transformer on the other side of the wall and it's just wiped out your communications. But there are cases when you're going to want that. Uh, another thing to consider is your distance to your door. So uh, certain types of locks like magnetic door locks use a lot of power. So if you have all your access equipment at one end of the building and you have this door all the way at the other end that's a magnetic lock, you're gonna to have to consider having a power supply all the way down there uh, along with all of the kind of additional issues that power supplies uh, entail and we'll talk about it, that as well. Something else to consider when you're placing your access control equipment is the room that you're placing it in. Is it gonna be too hot, too cold? Again, is there gonna be a, you know, a transformer or a large motor on the other side of the wall? Is there a wall of concrete or cinder block that you're gonna to have to drill through to get to all of the doors on this side. Uh, just things to consider. I can't tell you how many times I had to go to a, an HOA's pool house to fix the gate access control system and the thing is just rusted solid because they stuck it in the same room as the salt water pool water conditioning equipment. So just think about that kind of stuff because your warranty is only gonna get you so far. 
So let's talk first about something simple like a, a dock. So you have 70, 80 dock doors in a warehouse. It's probably seven or 800 feet. That's probably gonna be too long for you to run ethernet to the other end of without fiber and media converters and much other stuff you don't wanna deal with. So this is a perfect situation for RS-485. You know, every 10 dock doors, I've got this little, this little person door right here that you know, somebody's gonna be going in and out of and you wanna batch uh, access to that. So what you can do is you can put your ethernet powered access panel at one end by door number one and then just run RS-485, which is relatively cheap, all the way down and do drops where you need those doors. So that's a situation where having that cheaper but maybe not quite as reliable wiring is gonna be helpful for you. On the other hand, you have an office building where there's not a lot of, uh, you, know, if you get a lot of square footage, uh, but you probably could get away with doing just a, you know, a little room right here with an access panel and you just hang all of your other door controllers right after that and then have those go out to the individual doors. For an office space like that, something else to consider is, uh, this is a, you know, like a class A building, it's got elevators, it's essentially two mirrored half floors here. Well, if something happens like, I don't know, a pandemic and work at home situation that causes all of your real estate to be underutilized, maybe you're gonna to wanna to sublease half of a floor in the future. So it's good to think about that kind of thing now in your situation and maybe think, I'll do an access panel over here somewhere with all the doors powered off of that and then an access panel over here with all the doors powered off of that and that way, if they decide to sublease half of my space, I can just close off this door, close off this door, disconnect it from my system and then whoever subleases it can deal with it. So it's just, again, something to think about. Typically a vendor will give you a, a uh, project manager that you can work you can work with so just kind of keep that in mind when you're working on stuff like this the really important thing from my perspective is a lot of vendors will say well you've got three floors we have 4,000 feet to work with so we'll just do all of them hanging off of one board down on the first floor and run 4,000 feet of continuous wire all the way up to the top again please don't do this you're gonna be really unhappy when you're uh, access vendors having to tear out drywall to reach some wiring because they decided to cheap out. This is a, a typical board layout that I would do in a, in a typical office environment. So this is a, uh, an enclosure with a power supply. The power supplies are right here. And what I'll do is I'll have my access board right here and then I'll have individual door controllers hanging off of that with that RS-485 connection. This particular enclosure I like because all of this stuff was pre-wired by the manufacturer, so all the RS-485s and the relays and everything all just plug in. The only wire that you have to run to this is the wiring that goes actually to the doors themselves. A little bit about wiring to the door. So you have a bunch of wires that you're gonna have to run from your board to the door or gate or whatever it is that you're powering. So you'll have power for the door hardware that unlocks and locks the door. If you have a motion sensor, you'll have to run power to that as well. You'll have shielded cabling to the badge reader itself. There's two different ways to wire the badges and we'll talk about that in a second. And then you have your door contact and your request to exit wiring, so the contacts that tell the system the status of the door. And then a tamper switch for your badge reader so somebody can't just pull it off the wall. And any auxiliary inputs and outputs. The wrong way, and I've seen this happen, this particular image I got off the internet, but it, I've seen stuff very similar to that, is uh, undersized uh, power conductors to your door lock hardware, either undersized because they went undersized or undersized because they decided to try to take an existing wire and go way too far with it. And the voltage drop causes the door to not unlock uh, reliably or a magnetic lock to not lock sufficiently where you can just pull the door open even though it's locked. Um, of course, fire hazard is an issue there when they decide to just twist together additional wires to make a thicker wire. That's never good to have up in a ceiling that you can't see what's going on. For your communications wire, typically unshielded or spliced cable. I can't tell you how many times I saw unshielded Cat3 telephone cable being run to badge readers. It's not gonna work, you're not gonna like the, the situation. And what happens is you get unreliable communications with the badge reader and sometimes the badge reader crashes and stops working and you gotta go in and un actually unplug it at the board to reset it. Uh, and then no wiring for your tamper or your auxiliary inputs or outputs. The worst that can happen there is if somebody can pull the badge reader off the wall, they can attach a device in there and capture badge numbers as they flow from the badge reader to your system. Um, the 
least worst thing that could happen is by not adding auxiliary inputs and outputs, you have limited expandabilities. You know, they want to put a buzzer in there or something, and you have to run new wire just for that. So having those extra pairs there also as a spare, in case you know a wire gets cut or, or fails in some way, you can do that without having to start, again, tearing out drywall. This is the right way. This is slightly more expensive than running all these individual conductors, but it's such a cleaner installation. It's called composite access control cable. So all of your power cables, all of your communications cables, which are property, properly shielded because this is made specifically for access control systems, uh, and has a nice thick exterior jacket. So if they're pulling it through a drop ceiling and they scrape it along the sharp piece of metal, it's less likely to damage the interior uh, wire. The most important part for this, in my opinion, is if they've pulled this cable, you know they've pulled proper cable because you're not going to find this in a, an unshielded, you know, kind of junk cable. So I always recommend this whenever you're doing either a, a new system or you're adding to an existing system. A little bit about your power supplies and enclosures. So uh, the power supply will typically take your 110 volts and it'll output a 12 or 24 volts DC to power the board, the card reader, the motion detector, and the hardware that unlocks the door. So you, what you want to do is make sure that you have something that is sufficient amperage for the load that you're going to give it. And the temperature range, these are really heavily, they have good heat sinks on them, so they're designed to run sealed in a metal box up on the wall in an unair conditioned room. If you're going to put it in a hot room or a steamy room or something like that, you're going to want to make sure that it's rated for the temperatures that you're going to throw at it. Also, make sure you get a power supply that has a built-in charger. Uh, it's really unfortunate when the power goes out and you can't get in the building to turn the power back on because there were no batteries attached to your access control system. Uh, so make sure that that is specified. The enclosures themselves are typically um, built in with the power supplies, like that, that image that we saw earlier. Um, again, just make sure you get something with, that has the capability to charge batteries. They're in multiple sizes, um, depending on whether you have one or two panels or you have a big one like that one that I showed. Um, you can do DIY or pre-wired. Make sure that they have a key lock and a tamper switch. The tamper switch you can wire to your panel, and if somebody pries open the door, you'll get a, a notification. So it, anytime, especially in a place where maybe it's in a closet that has a key or uh, you know cleaning supplies or something like that, just make sure you have those tampers set up. You can also get these in a waterproof uh, form factor. I generally don't like doing waterproof exterior. I'd prefer to put it in a shack, but sometimes you've got that gate all the way at the other end of the parking lot, and there's no place for you to mount it. So a waterproof enclosure will help you in that regard. And a little talk about batteries. These are standard gel cell batteries. They're the same ones that you get for UPSs. Um, they're very cheap. You can get them from Home Depot for 20 bucks. So there's not really any reason to not replace them regularly. I recommend writing the install date on the batteries with a permanent marker, and then replacing them every three to five years. Every three years, if they're in a hot room with you know no air conditioning, if they're in a server room, you can generally replace them about every five years. The way you can tell is if you pick up the battery, you shake it, and it rattles. It means that the electrolytes all dried out, and it's time to replace it. Again, same thing. Make sure that you have that uh, checked regularly. And remote power supplies. The folks that work for the company I work for might notice this from the lunchroom, this picture. Uh, when you have power hungry locks like magnetic locks and motorized crash bars, uh, what will happen is often they'll have to put a, a, a second power supply just to power the, the door hardware itself. What they'll often do is they won't tell you about this, they'll figure it out after they've done the wire and they'll just stick one up in the ceiling above the door or maybe above a conference room or maybe above something else and you'll never know about it until the power goes out and again they've used the cheapest power supply possible and haven't got batteries in it. So make sure that you work with your project manager when they're laying this out and if there's a magnetic lock down a long hallway or a motorized lock, ask them, is this going to require a power supply? If so, I'm going to want a tamper switch, I'm going to want AC fail and battery fail con uh, connections and I'm going to want batteries in that thing. A little bit about fire safety. So there's two ways that a door can fail when the power goes out, fail safe or fail secure. <clears throat> fail safe means that you can exit the building and open the door and if the power goes out. That is the way that you should do doors in any place 
other than very specific secure doors that need to uh, need to be fail secure. But if you do a fail secure door, which means the door stays locked if the power goes out, make sure anybody who's in there has a way to get out, whether it's some kind of bypass or uh, you know, specify the lock hardware so that you can still turn the handle and exit out of the place. Uh, when you're putting your system in, you're going to want to make sure you follow local code, obviously, and your AHJ, your authority having jurisdiction, that could be a fire marshal, it could be building inspector, but there are laws regarding, again, what you could do fail safe, what you could do fail secure. Sometimes, for instance, if you have a badge reader to exit the building, you need to have like a a handle with a tear off cover that you can pull the handle to unlock the door to get out so that you're not trapped in the building. So very important to uh, have that uh, taken care of. As well as a, any building that you have that has a fire alarm, uh, depending on the age and the size of the building and your jurisdiction, sometimes they're, re being, they're required to tie in the fire alarm to your access control system with these relays so that if uh, there's a fire, it will automatically unlock doors that allow people to escape. All right, uh, so there's a few different types of door hardware. I'm not gonna go over all of these. I will mention magnetic locks in particular. Um, again, they're gonna need more power than the standard lock and your power supply may not be able to provide that, so you may have to do an additional power supply for that. And a magnetic lock, of course, always fails safe because it's an electromagnet and when the electro goes away, so does the magnet. Uh, your door hardware has two different contacts that tells the system what condition your door is in. There's the door contact, which is the status, is my door open or is my door closed? And that's typically either a read switch that's attached on the door frame or it's integrated into the hardware somewhere. And then you have something called the request to exit or REX. That is what allows the door to open from the secure side or the inside without triggering a warning that the door has been forced open. This is how you tell the system, I'm opening this door legitimately from the inside, nobody's prying it open from the outside. Those are typically a button, a buzzer from the reception desk, a motion detector, or a micro switch that's integrated into the handle itself. For a, these two contacts, you need supervision. This is the thing that is left out of every access control system installation that I've seen unless specifically requested by the customer. Supervision is a pair of resistors that are wired in line with your door contact or your RECs, and it basically splits the signal into four different signals. So right now, if I cut this wire, the system doesn't know, did I cut the wire or did the door switch open up the connection? By using these supervision resistors as close to the contact as possible, and some contacts have them integrated, so you don't even need them externally, you've now got four different readings of ohms depending on whether the wire was shorted or cut or if the door is open or closed. So very important, these are very cheap. There's, it's pure laziness that this is not done regularly. Uh, motion detectors are uh, another, are, are an attack vector for people getting into buildings. Um, these are often used for your request to exit. Um, on some doors, like a magnetic door, it'll also trigger the door unlock. So if you can get the motion detector to read from outside the door, you can open the door without having to use a badge. So if you have that situation, I'm not gonna go into it too much. There's attacks all over YouTube, mylar balloons, frozen sprays from air dusters. There's some mitigations here that you can use to uh, uh, help reduce the attack vector on that one. Along with that door handle attacks, you know, reach under with a wire and pull the handle down. Um, again, very common. There are some mitigations here as well. Uh, so badges and readers. Badge readers come in different sizes and types. They handle, you know, fobs, badges, smart cards. If you're from the 80s, they handle magnetic stripe cards. Um, additional factors, biometrics and pin entry. Um, there are four main kind of types of badges that I've worked with regularly. The first two are, are fairly broken and easy to clone. Those are the ones you, most companies still use. Um, there's uh, the MyFair does fire and COs, which are not officially broken, but they have some weaknesses that some people have been able to exploit in specific circumstances, but still way better than the little card at Walmart that says, call us and we can duplicate your, your fob for you. Um, a little bit about the badge formats. It's an old 26-bit format. It's from the 80s. It's easy to clone. You can read it right off the wires behind the card reader, which is why we put a tamper on our card readers 
to make sure that if somebody pulls it off the wall, we know. There's also, uh, you know, people can put them in a suitcase with a battery and just walk past your badge and read it. Um, this format is uh, pretty well known. The solution there is a custom format. So uh, the one that I'm familiar with is called Corporate 1000. Again, I have no, you know, no, I don't get paid by any of these people. But the, it's a CO's card, so it's a little more secure. You get a dedicated facility code. So uh, nobody can duplicate your, your facility code because each ID manufactures the cards and ships them directly to you with the facility code that they've assigned you. Um, to make sure that there's no bypass on that, you have to reprogram all of your readers to not accept the older 26-bit cards. And you could do that with a stack of configuration cards that they're going to mail you. Uh, I've only got a couple minutes left, so I'm kind of rushing here. Um, so badge readers themselves, they use, a, again, this old protocol from 1975 called Wigan. It's trivial to capture uh, card information with these, and you can just buy a badge reader off of eBay and start capturing cards, essentially. The solution to that is called OSDP. Um, it uses different wiring. It uses the same RS-485 that we use to connect boards together. Uh, and it's not perfect. There are, if you Google OSDP bypasses on YouTube, you'll find a couple of videos. Again, it's not, it's not trivial by any means, but it is possible. So your mitigation there, again, reader tamper switches. Make sure that that's on your list. All right. Oh, I missed it. Did I? No, I didn't. OK. So what's the takeaway here? Work closely with your project manager. Um, you know now things like long distance uh, doors away from what you're doing. If you have to get in that gate at the outside of the parking lot, work with them, figure out what they're going to do to get those wired correctly and securely. You're going to set expectations. If they say, oh, hey, we ran out of that composite access cable, so we just ran a bunch of crap that we had on the truck, don't accept it. Make sure that they know ahead of time that you're going to be checking on this. And spot check. So if they're pulling cable, look through, make sure it's the right cable, make sure that there's enough wires there, check when they're doing those door switches and make sure that there's resistors on there, ask questions, um, document. So I put a little sticker on the bottom of each reader with a door number and I put that system and that door number in my access control system. So if somebody says, hey, this door isn't working, I can say, look at the number on the bottom and tell me what it is and I know exactly which door is the problem. Do your regular maintenance. Battery replacement is the thing that is done the least on these systems. I've opened these things up and they've swollen to almost round and uh, you don't want them leaking acid out of your access control cabinet. Um, and then the other thing is visit the Physical Security Village. Uh, they have a ton of videos on YouTube. Uh, they're at a bunch of different conferences, including DEF CON. I'll actually be um, volunteering there so I can answer any questions there as well. And I'll be giving a similar talk to this there as well. And that's it for me. So I have a um, QR code right here. This is to my uh, repository. I don't have anything there now, but by the end of the day, I will have an R that RFP that I've created that I give to any access control vendor when we're going to install the system, and as well as a copy of the slide deck. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I actually have five minutes for questions.